All right. So um, thanks for joining. Uh, I will be taking questions. I'll, I'll probably try to answer them at the end, um, time permitting. Uh, definitely feel free to ask questions, though. Um, I love it. So Protractor is going away. Now what? Um, this is the presentation today. What are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the past. What made Protractor a great tool? What made it a great framework for end-to-end -end testing? Uh, the present. What's going on with Protractor now? Uh, and the future, uh, spoiler, uh, Protractor is kind of going away slowly, so you may want to move on from it. So, a um, little oh, quick introduction. Hello, I'm Josh Grant. I am a senior solution architect at Sauce Labs. I've been at Sauce Labs for three years. And uh, I have been in test automation for uh, 11 years. Uh, I'm kind of interesting. I've only ever done test automation uh, professionally. So, some folks start in QA um, as an exploratory tester or some kind of QA role, and they, they get into automation. Some people start as a developer, back end, front end, and specialize into automation. Uh, I just started out um, right from the get go getting into test automation. So, kind of interesting perspective, I think. And we can jump right into it. Um, so, in the beginning, there was AngularJS. So the first release that I find publicly uh, was October 2010, um, which is like very old <laughs> by Node.js standards. So uh, Angular was released, uh, kind of backed by, by Google. Um, it was one of the earliest Node.js based front end frameworks. So once this was um, released, uh, it made a lot of people very happy. Um, definitely like a forerunner of React, Vue, all of that stuff, um, backed by a very big, well-respected company, uh, Google. So it was very exciting. So uh, at release, so Angular had a lot of fun stuff, but it did not have any sort of test automation tool included with the project. So when you installed Angular, um, it didn't come with a unit testing tool, it didn't come with an end-to-end -end test testing tool. Um, I'll better check this question. Make sure I'm all right. Change code of contact. Great. Um, so yeah, so Angular didn't come with any tooling for testing, which is fine. Uh, 2010, early days. Uh, it was very early days for a lot of things back then uh, when it comes to web and the modern web. So in 2012, uh, Protractor uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. 0 was released. This was the first public release available on GitHub that I could find. So a couple of years later, um, somebody, uh, hopefully at Google and someone in the Angular project decided to undertake some effort to create an end-to-end -end testing tool, testing framework. There was much rejoicing. So Selenium, I, I was looking this up a little bit earlier. Um, so 2010 Angular released, 2011, uh, Selenium, the Selenium 2.0 bindings, if you will, were released. The kind of Selenium web driver kind of came on the scene officially. And so in 2012, um, you had, uh, which was a Node.js based tool associated with Angular and the Angular project um, roll out as well and make use of the Selenium bindings. So in or in 2014, which is basically the Stone Ages, we are talking about Node.js, um, I, I was using Protractor uh, at work. Um, I was an Angular application. Uh, I had previously worked with uh, Java and Selenium uh, for, for a different web-based product, and then started working with uh, Protractor with an Angular-based uh, front end. And in my opinion, and I think this is true circa this time, Protractor was really the best browser-based testing tool around. Um, it was was very, very good, and it worked extremely well with Angular front ends. So in fact, it was so good, <laughs> people wanted to use Protractor itself for non-Angular-based apps. And people even wanted to replicate Angular functionality and the Angular, sorry, uh, the Protractor framework for in other languages other than JS. So here's an example that I uh, dug up, and I remember this back in the day, or like, I, I want to use Protractor, but I'm in Java. Is there a Java version of a Protractor? And the answer was maybe. So projects like this kind of appeared, JProtractor. Um, 
people talked about, you know, they had other legacy front end frameworks that were not JavaScript based, not Angular based. Um, can I use Protract with that? And you sort of could. Um, but it was very, people, people really liked Protractor and they really wanted to use it specifically. What was, so what was, what was the big deal? Um, uh, Protractor was a really good tool and I want to delineate between Protractor, the tool and Protractor, the, the community and the ecosystem around it. But let's start with the tool. The tool was really good. So what was great about it? It used the Selenium project JavaScript bindings. So the Selenium project supports, so Selenium is the Selenium web driver is now officially, and at the time was working towards being the web standard, W3C standard for uh, browser automation. So if you want to comply to standards, if you're a browser vendor, if things like W3C and you know having a good standardized experience, you would want to use the Selenium project and Selenium bindings. Uh, there's five different languages they support officially. One of them is JavaScript. So Protract the use of these, these bindings, the specific bindings from the Selenium project. Uh, and other projects at the time, comparable end-to-end uh, -end testing tools did not, or sort of did, um, whereas the Protractor project did. It said, we're definitely going to use these bindings. So it had sort of the, the check of approval, the stamp of approval, uh, the Selenium project. It also had built-in synchronization. So this was really, really helpful. If you've ever had to write front-end or uh, browser-based tests with Selenium, Something that can really trip you up is waiting for a page to load, right? So the Selenium web driver will wait for a page to finish loading. Uh, but what does that mean? Does that mean your JavaScript is all uh, finished rendering? Does it mean HTML is finished rendering? Does it mean any server-side requests are, are done and completed? Um, does it mean the little spinner guy isn't there? Like, it could mean any of those things, right? So you have to customize this waiting process for to some extent, um, and that's tricky. So the Angular project with Protractor decided we're going to have a built-in hook. So you just know when Angular pages are going to finish rendering, so you can interact with them. Um, you also had custom elements uh, locators. Uh, you could use ng model, ng binding, um, ng repeater. Uh, so, like, you had really good integration with um, the front end constructs of how elements are defined in Angular, uh, and how you can also do, you can reference those elements in Protractor. Um, and last and certainly not least, Protractor came with a pretty good CLI, so you could just run your tests. Um, and it had some fun utilities like Element Explorer, uh, which was a fun way to like verify like where is your element DOM, is it the right one? So it was it was a really well thought out tool. In addition. Protractor also had a very good ecosystem and community. So what does this mean? There were people at Google who were on staff paid by Google to maintain and commit to the, uh, the Protractor project. Um, there's a handful of people at the start. So when you opened a ticket, when you opened a, a pull request, someone from Google would look at that and, and be able to handle those requests. So they were handled very uh, timely. New features rolled out in a, in a timely manner. Life was good. Uh, as I mentioned before, so other projects at the time, like Nightwatch and WebDriver.io, didn't quite have the same level of backing from either the Selenium project or Google. So these projects uh, used unofficial bindings. They didn't use the Selenium or the WebDriver bindings from the Selenium project. Uh, they didn't have people on staff at Google making sure the projects were good, um, which meant they, they moved a bit more slow than the Protractor project did. Lastly, <laughs> love this, love this. Uh, so Protractor made this decision most based on how the Selenium bindings work, uh, WebDriver JS bindings, to make uh, to make calls or asynchronous explicit. Right, you had to handle the asynchronous nature of JavaScript yourself, Protractor. Um, whereas projects like Nightwatch and, and WebDriver.io made asynchronous coding implicit, right? Like the API kind of hid that from you. You could just write some code and it would execute synchronously without you having to learn promises or learn callbacks. Um, whereas the Selenium, or sorry, the Protractor project you know, made that explicit. You did have to learn 
promises and which which sounds great right because then if you're a javascript developer and you're familiar with asynchronicity and callbacks and promises you could just easily start using uh protractor right so th these were kind of things that early on made protractor really good um the tool was good the ecosystem was good so things were good for a while um nothing or what's the phrase um the only constant is is change right so what happened uh things were going along tickety boo right but there were problems on the horizon so protractor is still to this day very popular um often with angular front ends like if your if your main app is based in angular um, you might use protractor uh, but some teams don't even do that they will use protractor with other front end frameworks so that's fine um but but problems and sort of things start to creep up on the horizon Honest, so in my opinion, uh, this is really a question of how the Protractor project didn't keep up with changes in the way Node.js um, communities or the Node.js world worked. Um, and it also just didn't maintain that good community and system that it started out so strong with. So things start to fall apart. Um, so, so minor things from, from version to version, especially when you look at Angular versions, you have Angular JS, then you go to Angular two, you know, the MS breaking change Angular two. You know, everyone was unhappy. Angular four um, and subsequent versions. So as major versions of Angular rolled out, um, there were some minor issues. There were some things that were nice features of Protractor that eventually disappeared or just didn't turn out to be that useful. So one of them was Angular app. Um, one of them was Angular app synchronization. So like I said before, one of the cool features, one of the selling points of Angular early on, or sorry, of Protractor early on, automatically syncs with Angular apps. Um, it turns out like, this wasn't that helpful. So if you, so first of all, if you weren't using an Angular front end, um, you had to disable this feature. So you could use Protractor period with some other JS front end or some other front end which a lot of people are interested in doing. And also eventually, like you would still have to do some kind of synchronization. You would have to wait for spinners to disappear, wait for um, certain traffic to be resolved and certain calls outbound to be resolved. So this automatic waiting was eventually disabled in later person than Angular. So not that helpful. Uh, locating elements by models and repeaters and bindings, not that helpful. Uh, you can just use Rick's locators. Uh, this wasn't something that was that great. It seemed like a really good idea at first. Um, didn't turn out to be that good. Um, and, and also, as the Node.js ecosystem and tooling evolved, um, certain things just were unnecessary, right? Like, um, Protractor was released before a time when you could just write an NPM script to like call something, to call like an external action. Um, this was, it was also before like, the, like the sort of semi regularization of using uh, conf.js files for different test frameworks. So um, a lot of the advantages that Protractor had early on, like got caught up uh, other tools and, and, and just Node.js ecosystem caught up with uh, sort of those. The two biggest, so those, those are some smaller things that, you know, were kind of not great, um, but, but two things that I think really sent the Protractor project downhill. <laughs> or, sorry, let me step back. Two things that were significant issues within the Protractor world were making asynchronicity explicit, right? Forcing users to have to handle asynchronicity. Uh, and more interestingly, no, no plugin or service layer. So I think these are the two issues. So, so remember when I said how everyone loved the fact that Protractor used the official Selenium JS bindings, um, which explicitly you know made users use promises and asynchronicity, uh, and how awesome that was, and, and how everyone loved it. Well, turns out it wasn't that great actually. <laughs> um, seemed like a good idea at the time, uh, but it, it led to problems. So here here's a good example. Um, I apologize for the the sloppy um, you know formatting. So here is a simple test 
uh, to verify that you know you can log into a login page, kind of a message. And this looks fine, right? Like this looks like any kind of code you might write uh, to, to write some sort of browser-based test to you know verify like when I log in with my username and my access key, uh, can I can I log in? Um, this looks fine, right? This looks like it should run. I don't. If you look carefully, though, surprise, uh, things are asynchronous. So the, the actions in the it block here, there's no guarantee they'll execute the order that they're presented, right? Um, JavaScript is asynchronous. Um, and in my experience, 11 years in, you never want or almost never want to write an ace end to end test. Right, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to. It doesn't matter whether I enter in my username first or I click the login button first. Like it actually does matter. Like there is an order to things, so you want to build in that synchronous. But that's not what Protractor did. You you had to handle recipe. So surprise, it wasn't actually that great. So if you want to be explicit and you want to verify that in fact this will execute the way you think it will. Um, you need to use some kind of, um, you need to use some approach. Uh, at the time, when I was working with Protractor many years ago, this is an example of promises. So you would have to you know, use thens and then blocks to, to verify that you log in, you, to your, you send your keys to your username, then you send your key password, then you click the login button, and, and then you verify your exit. Of course, times have changed, and you don't have to do this. Um, but at the time, and for a while in Protract, it's promises. So, so this is already kind of a pain in the butt because you know you're going to write synchronous code. You know you have to execute these these tasks in order, and so you're going to have all this overhead of, of having then statements and thenable um, returns, and you have to understand all how, how all that works, which fine, but then you also have other aspects of your code that you need to handle. It's not just your tests, right? Objects. So imagine you need to now write um, a bunch of logic in page objects. Uh, you have to be able to handle then statements to execute certain things asynchronously, uh, sorry, asynchronously. And back in the day, there are no ES6 classes. Like if you go back uh, many more. <laughs> you some other pattern to represent a page uh, object, right? You have to sort of hack together some kind of um, way of forming an object in the, or a class, if you will, in, in JavaScript. So, so this got pretty, um, and that's just the structure of page objects. Um, imagine you also now want to do something in your test, like you have a list or grid. And you want to go through and you know find a certain element to interact with it. That means you have to all asynchronously in this situation. So your then statements also have fours. You have to make sure you're returning at the right place. And you know, do I do I return an error? Do I return a rejected promise? You have to learn all that stuff. So in it, you know, in um, comparison to other selenium based tools at the time so going back like you know five six years um not only did you have to understand like the test automation portion like how selenium works how 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 to like you know, interact with elements you then also had to learn um asynchronously you have to learn promises you have to understand all that stuff so there's an extra hurdle that wasn't present with you know other languages like java or python or other things and then you have to the complicated scenarios where you're kind of going through elements and clicking. And then on top of this, something that nobody could have predicted or I couldn't have predicted was, so you finally get into it, you finally figure out promises, you write your page objects, you handle all that. And then ES6 classes roll out, async await rolls out, and now you have a lot of refactoring to do. Um, so thanks, but no thanks. Um, it's just, Protractor really did put a big onus on end users to, to kind of handle all that and maintain all that. So not my favorite. Um, it was a headache for me, and it's probably a headache for a lot of other people. So 
the tool made some choices that affected users down the road. But let's talk about the ecosystem, right? Because the ecosystem used to be really great. Um, so, so long story short, uh, those folks at Google who maintain Protractor no longer maintain Protractor. Um, so you don't have as many people just you know working on and committing to the project as you used to. But more fundamentally, there was no there's no plugin ecosystem, right? So again, when when things were small and new, this this was fine, right? Like everything went into the core project. So if you wanted some kind of functionality in Protractor, open a pull request, you know, or or see how it works. Maybe there's like a smart engineer who kind of understands how these things are, put together examples, put together documentation. But over time, like this just becomes uh, a big burden on the overall project because as people want more and more functionality, um, which, you know, people might not want all of these functionalities, but, you know, they might want, you know, uh, certain aspects of them or a certain particular subset of them. Um, it still all just came with the core project. So things like parallelization. If I wanted to run my parallel or my, my protractor tests in parallel, um, I had to depend on functionality provided by protractor itself. And there were other ways to do it as well, but the core of it tend, tended to kind of fall onto the main project. Test reporting. If I wanted to use a tool like Allure or Extent, or if I wanted to, you know, pipe out my you know, output into a different version or different form, like change an XML, had to depend on the Protractor project itself to do that. Uh, mobile. Eventually, Appian took off. Uh, other mobile automation tools took off. People started asking questions like, you know, what happens if I want to run my web-based tests on a mobile environment? If I want to look at something on mobile Safari or on this like real device that I have sitting right here in front of me, um, that had to be handled by the core project. You couldn't sort of interface nicely with Appium or other mobile-based tools. Um, you had to go into the core project of, of um, Protractor. And, you know, like, like these kinds of things. So, so lots and lots of stuff just kind of went into the, the, the core machinery of Protractor instead of, you know, getting split out um, into like plugins or services where someone could take care of that. So, so, so what does this mean in practice? Well, if you wanted to, you know, let's say you wanted to get Protractor working with Appium or, or you had a problem with using Appium instead of Selenium as your driver, uh, you have to open a PR, uh, you have to open a GitHub ticket. Um, if Protractor wasn't working with Soft Labs, uh, this is one near and dear to my heart. Um, we, uh, we, you know, Soft Labs, uh, we are uh, purveyors of digital confidence. Um, and one of our core products is just a big old cloud based uh, Selenium grid and hub uh, for tests. So if you, had a if you had trouble using Protractor with a service like Sauce, um, there was no sauce plugin or sauce functionality that, that sauce could just handle and then fix it goes into the core project. So you have to open up a GitHub uh, ticket or PR to the core project, uh, and hope it gets fixed. And we see this all the time. Um, what about when changes in the Selenium world, such as Selenium four moving to the W3C protocol, which some people are probably like, what, what does that even mean? Um, well, it means that as that Selenium for changes the way that remote web drivers uh, communicate. So, which again, that's something that's handled in the core Protractor project. So you have to open a GitHub ticket or PR and someone has to approve that and read that. Uh, which, as I've said before, um, people were doing that. There are a lot of issues. The issues pile up. The pull requests pile up. You don't have um, as many people working on the project and dedicated to it. You have a lot of complexity in terms of like, what if I want to use Sauce Labs with Appium? Well, is that like a, something you need to look at on the Appium side? It's on the Sauce Lab side. Is it the core protractor side? It's very, very confusing. So issues and tickets pile up. Things get more um, difficult to work with, which means more goes into the core project. Core project isn't getting done. That uh, leads to a big dumpster fire. So um, 
if you look, you'll see that there are many, many, many open issues and open PRs in the core uh, pro protracted project. Um, contributors from Google are no longer contributing. Uh, out, uh, contributors from outside of Google who did contribute often uh, are no longer contributing. Um, like my my good friend and colleague, um, uh, Mr. Will, uh, Wim Sellers, uh, based in the EU. Uh, he's, he's contributed often to the project project in the past, but he, he hasn't been able to do so because it's just it's too much work. So where are things now? Um, so the future is bleak for the Protractor project after being so bright. Um, and I believe the Angular project itself has decided that as of version 15, Angular will not be included. Or sorry, Protractor will not be included with Angular. So, so when you install like version 15, uh, the protractor dependencies and functionalities will not be included in the core project anymore. So what does this mean that effectively the project is end of life? Um, it won't have support from within the Angular community. Uh, the, the project won't have support from elsewhere. Um, so it, it's essentially end of life. It's not going to be maintained. So it goes. Um, uh, as someone who, who saw how protractor could be so good and it was such a nice uh way of working in the past um it's a bit sad but uh these things happen it's the way things go so so what do you do if you're sitting on a bunch of protractor tests and you're thinking okay well this sounds bad what should i do here um uh the, the good news is this uh there are a bunch of end-to-end -end testing tools uh, and projects in the node.js world like a ton of them <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> um, or, I, I mean, this this is my pitch. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a Python guy, really. Um, but like there there are other languages you can choose. If, if you're looking for an opportunity to not work in JavaScript uh, for your end-to-end -end testing, uh, there's a lot of other choices you can make. You can look at Python, you can look at Ruby, you can look at Java, .NET. All of them have advantages. All of them have some benefits. Um, it's just like the JS itself, like uh, Node.js has a lot of benefits as well. But my, my big advice, um, get off of Protractor. So pick another tool, pick another framework and migrate. Just like make the cut over um, and do it um, as soon as you can. So, so what would you choose? Like, let's say we're in the JavaScript world. Uh, let's say you, you like Node.js, you like Angular, you don't want to leave that world. Well, let me give you some some choices. Uh, so as I said, there's like a lot. <laughs> this is just a selection of them. Uh, so the most popular projects out now uh, are include WebDriver.io, uh, Playwright, and Cypress, and there's some other ones. So the one, I, the one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really recommend first and foremost is WebDriver.io. So um, WebDriver.io is, is probably the, the best tool out there. It's, it's certainly the best to in comparison to where Protractor left off. Uh, when Protractor was good, WebDriver.io kind of just kept going and got better. Playwright is interesting. So I do want to just put a little foot, footnote for Playwright because um, so the Playwright team is currently working for Microsoft. And um, they previously were the same individuals were working at Google uh, under the Puppeteer project. So I guess for reasons that I'm not privy to, they left Google uh, and are now working at Microsoft. Um, Playwright is very interesting, going from uh, Puppeteer, which was JS only and Chrome only. Uh, now Playwright is going cross-browser and cross-language, so you don't have to stay in the JS world. And if you need to support things like Safari and Firefox, Playwright's also good. Um, would definitely you know consider that. And Cypress, people seem to like it. I don't know, whatever. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about WebDriver.io. So it's probably the best choice right now. It's very mature, it's a very well-formed project, um, and it's very comprehensive. So what I mean by that is there's a ton of things you can do and different mixes and matches of features and functionality. So if you have a, a tiny project, just a handful of tests, they just got to run like you know on your box every now and again, but driver works. If you're an enterprise team and you have a lot of tests, and you need reporting and you need integration with tools and you need um, an active community that's, that's going to keep up with, with changes in the, the wider Node.js world, uh, WebDriver.io is going to help you out. 
Uh, the lead maintainer is Christian Broman. Excellent guy. I've met him. Quiet, smart, great guy. Um, he uh, is still the active lead maintainer of the project. Uh, so it's a very healthy project. And as well, I believe it was him. Uh, he may have written this tool. I don't know if it was him and someone else. Uh, there is an automatic tool for migrating from Protractor to WebDriver.io. So this is helpful. Um, apparent, I have, I'm on good authority. I haven't done this, but I'm on good authority. This, this tool works well. Um, you know, it's relatively painless. Like you just point it to your protractor tests and you get some kind of web driver tests on the other side. So that's helpful. Um, but yeah, um, if you take away nothing else from this presentation, just know that protractor is going away <laughs> and not coming back. And uh, choose a good tool to migrate to, have a plan, and migrate to go to something else. And that's it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, for bearing with me. Uh, and I'm happy to take some with some questions and have a chat. Perfect. I think we've got one in there right now. Are you able to see the Q&A questions? I am. Okay. Okay. So a question from Jared. Uh, where would you go for the .NET Core related implementations. Okay, so, um, so .NET. Um, so if you have .NET, uh, Selenium is the way to go. Um, as far as I know, there isn't really a, .NET is really interesting because there isn't like a one-stop shop test tool or framework like WebDriver.io. So WebDriver.io is in JavaScript. Um, Water uh, is in Ruby. Um, they're, they're kind of, um, PyTest Selenium or some other things. Um, and Java has tools like, um, but so .NET, as far as I know, .NET doesn't have like a, a framework that you kind of use off the, off the shelf. Um, Th that being said, like I know the .NET maintainer of the Selenium bindings is very active. Uh, one of my coworkers, uh, Nikolai Adelotkin, uh, ultimateqa.com, smart guy, super smart guy. Uh, he's uh, also very into .NET. Um, so I would just start with .NET Selenium, .NET with Appium, um, and you can go from there. All right, uh, another question, love it. Um, oh, I think I'll type the answer. Uh, all right. Um, so from Azel or Azel, uh, if you have non-angular apps, web apps in React, and you were using Selenium plus Protractor for testing, what would you consider to be the advantages, disadvantages of migrating to WebDriver.io versus Jest? Aha! So Jest, Jest shows up. Okay. Jest is fascinating. Um, uh, so my standard disclaimer, I am not like a React developer. I am not like a day-to-day Node.js developer. Um, so, so React is very popular. Uh, I've tried it. I like it. Um, and WebDriver, I've, I've talked about how great it is, and it is amazing. So Jest is, is interesting, too. So Jest is, <laughs> Jest is kind of JUnit just for testing. There is no additional layer for driving a browser or driving an application. Um, it, it is a, a it's more of a classic test framework. So let's say um, you, you had other tests that maybe test an API or test services or unit testing that don't include a browser. Um, so Jest can handle all those situations. As far as I know, Jest can handle uh, Jess can handle all those situations um, without a boat driver, but you can use that. You can use the WebJS bindings um, to alter tests uh, your browser. So um, my opinion, and it's just an opinion, is that a framework like WebDriver.io will save you a lot of time and effort building up all of these test things that you will have to build up with Jest. And WebDriver has some nice integrations as well. But so I mean, it's kind of like a granularity thing. Like, do you want to like get really 
you know, granular with like how you kind of structure out your tests or are you happy to have a framework kind of take care of that for you, I guess, um, is how I would think about deciding between WebDriver and Jest. Um, yeah. um, oh, I guess I'll answer that live. Uh, does WebDriver.io support component harness seamlessly or harnesses seamlessly? Um, that I don't know. I don't know because I don't know what component harnesses are. Um, my guess is probably if you're testing at the, the sort of end-to-end -end level, like I'm going to open up a browser and uh, click through and interact with elements, WebDriver.io should be able to handle that, including with... Uh, uh, React functionality as well, like Shadow DOM type things. Um, so that's fine. Uh, if you're testing at the React level, I want to test this specific component, or I don't even know what else. Like I said, I'm not a React developer. I don't know if WebDriver are able to support that. Um, so yeah, not not going to be too helpful on that question, but um, maybe, maybe. Or Jest, Jest would come into play there. Uh, Alex Torres. Okay, great. Uh, I was looking to invest, learn in Cypress IO. Could you provide a high, high level? Uh, could you provide a high level comparison? Why choose WebDriver IO over Cypress IO and vice versa? Thank you. Ah, yeah. Cypress. Everyone loves Cypress. Okay, so high level comparison. So Cypress. Um, Cypress has a very different user or developer experience or user experience. So it is on a bad, so it doesn't use any kind of form Selenium. WebDriver.io does use the Selenium protocol under the hood. Cypress does not. It kind of runs a service in your browser. Um, the experience is a little different. So Cypress is very geared towards developers. It's very geared toward, you know, let's write tests that are, that are short and sweet. Um, and there's kind of a developer console, there's tooling for kind of, uh, there's this feature where I guess you can go back and forth in your time traveling of your tests. Um, so it's it's very geared towards JS developers and people working in like a JS world. WebDriver.io is, I mean, also geared towards that, but it's a little more general purpose. Um, if you're an SDET tester, an exploratory tester, um, like it's not as sort of intimately, you know, as part of like the developer flow. So that's, that's one thing I can kind of say high level. Uh, the other thing I can say about Cypress is that, and I'm trying to think of how to, how to express this correctly. So Cypress has some really great functionality and good features. It's very tied to the Cypress um, paid service. So things like sharding and, and parallelization are something that you would you would need to use as a part of the Cypress service that you'd have to sign up for. Whereas WebDriver.io is, is a little more general purpose. Like you can, um, you, you're not required to use um, any sort of official services to like run your tests. You can target them at a Selenium grid or a cloud provider or just locally or whatever. Um, so that's, that's something to consider. Um, there's a whole lot. Some people don't, um, yeah, I guess, you know, if, if that's, if that's a good answer. Uh, uh, Guillermo, we are using the JSON server log to mock the responses from our HTTP. Yes. Will, pro, will the protractor migration tool require, uh-oh, internet connection's a little bit. Will the protractor migration tool require to rework the plumbing we've already set up for the mocking service responses, or does it only convert the tests, and should it work just fine after running the conversion? Oh, this is a good question. It's a good question. Uh, JSON server library. Okay. Uh, so I don't know the answer to this. Uh, definitely take a look at the tool to find out. My guess is, um, I don't know. I can't say for sure. I didn't write the tool. <laughs> um, it should be okay. Here's, here's why I think it might be okay. Is if you're using additional library or additional service um, to handle HTTP wire calls and either real HTTP wire calls or mock HTTP wire calls, which very good practice, keep it up 
everyone do this. It's good. Um, good job, everybody. Um, my guess is the tool will not touch those things or should not touch those things. It should sort of try to migrate your tests from a protractor like syntax to a WebDriver IO type syntax or form, I guess. Um, and the other advantage of using a service like you're doing is that because you're not depending on protractor functionality, um, if you have to rework some things, it should work. Like it should, you sh your plumbing should be able to, you should be able to migrate over and should be fine. Um, so yeah, I, I would tr I'd definitely try the tool. Um, great. It um, and I'm guessing it'll be fine. Oh, Follow-up question from Guillermo. Uh, does WebDriver.io contain a CLI where I can run terminal commands and quickly switch to my environments? Yes, like uh, dev product friend and test. What about yes and yes. So WebDriver.io does, yes, WebDriver.io does have a runner. Um, the, the runner is very uh, conventional to other tools. Uh, the main idea is uh, call the runner and then call config, the config file, like a wdo.config.js. Um, and then you're in that file, you have configurations. There are command line arguments as well that you can pass in uh, to either override um, values in your config file or um, I think you can change like browser name and things. Um, so, so that's, I mean, again, too, uh, best practice or best practice, a good practice. <laughs> I don't want to say best practice. A good practice as well is to have multiple config files for either different environments um, or, you know, or like these are the tests for, you know, staging, these are the tests for development, or these are the tests that are smoke and these are regression. Um, you consider having multiple config files, but there are some command line arguments. You can pass in for a driver IO. Playwright, yes. I think there's there is a there is a command line runner. Um, and there is a config file approach. Um, I haven't used it as much to say if you can switch these things easily. My guess is yes. Um, but also uh, the advantage of Playwright is that uh, it's uh, very like uh, you know very fast moving new projects. So if you have a if you have a request, take a look. I'm sure you know someone will roll it out. Let's just take a look. Oh, and some glitching. Yeah, I know. So it's always a problem up here. I don't know what it is. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, cool. Like uh, any any other questions, comments from anybody? Um, I'm happy to talk about all sorts of stuff. I'm happy to share my deck as well. I can pass that along, whatever that process looks like. I thought those were some great questions. So they were, you know, good follow ups, and I think it shows too that you've done a great a great job explaining things. So, but yeah, they are requesting your deck if you would like to share that. Uh, yeah, I will put that into a PDF and then send it to somebody <laughs> and then, uh, folks can have it. We, yeah, you and I will work that. We'll, we'll get that going. We'll make sure everybody has access to it. So, okay, perfect. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, then we will conclude for today. But, um, I do want to just remind everybody that we do have enterprise NG coming up on November 4th and 5th. So if you would like to come and strengthen your enterprise skills with Angular, this is going to be quite the event. Uh, we haven't quite announced our speakers yet, but my sneak peek shows me that this is going to be an event you do not want to miss. We have excellent speakers uh, lined up. And like I said, it's November 4th and 5th, and you can go check out the, the websites, just ngconf dot org so ng hyphen conf dot org but um yeah should be an excellent conference and we'd love to see you there other than that again we will make this recording available probably in a week or two please be patient with us as we get it edited down it'll be on our youtube channel the ng comp youtube channel and yeah i just want to say thank you again for coming and we'll hope to see you at some of our future events <laughs>